What's up, everybody? It's spreadsheet time! Whee! It looks different than before, uh, if you vaguely remember how it looked before. Uh, it's more charts, more pixels filled with confusion, which is the key to better simulation. Um, why this video? A couple of things I would like to address. First of all, a couple of videos ago I announced somewhat weirdly, proudly, happily that I've been doing something wrong for a long time. Uh, regarding aerodynamics calculations. Since then I've been hard at work doing all sorts of other things but also doing the spreadsheet again with new calculations and verification to make sure that this time uh, it's all good and dandy which it seems to be now. And so two things I would like to do or perhaps more. First of all uh, show the new stuff and secondly talk a bit about Ryza, which I also did in the last talk and drive with the ARC car at uh, Adelaide. Just giving you a bit of an insight in, in, in how we work at Ryza and uh, why things that I do wrong or good, but let's say wrong, uh, don't necessarily affect the Ryza product all that much. First of all though, what's new? Well, these tables giving you a map of, of ride heights, so we have the front ride height here between 0 and 4 centimeters, the rear ride height here between 0 and 4 centimeters, and then we can plot all sorts of stuff. Now this used to be fixed, right, so downforce, balance of the arrow, the diffuser arrow on its own, and the total drag of the car. Now, watch this, ooh, drop downs, this is nice, so I can actually decide what I want to plot in each chart, which was static before. And it's all done in VBA code now, which uh, was entertaining, <laughs> time-consuming, uh, confusing, but you might say it resembles fake, really fake programming skills, which I didn't have before, so that's cool. So I can set what I want to plot here, uh, choose between a lot of different things. So for example, I can look at the downforce, sure, drag, the balance, sure, the front down. But here's an in interesting one that we will get to later. Front percent static, rear downforce, rear percent static, the diffuser arrow, the efficiency, how good the car is at turning the drag into the downforce, the height of the front wing above the ground, because that's uh, ground effects of the, of the front wing are important, and the under tray, the front tray and the rear tray, the heights above uh, the ground, which is are the right height measurements point in, in the simulator. So there's a lot more stuff I can plot, plus I can decide, here I have downforce, in an absolute value, coefficient basically. Uh, things will look a bit weird every now and then with the charts because it's not perfect yet, but let's give it a velocity of uh, 50 meters per second. See, and now I have 2600 newtons of downforce. So that's a, at one is just a coefficient of about one, that's cool. So this is absolute coefficients, but sometimes I'd like relative because this is confusing sometimes. What are we looking at? Relative scales everything down. So here, this is what I had before, we have the percentage of downforce. So here the optimum downforce is with the front right height at zero and the rear right height somewhere in this area. And I know that if my right heights are all messed up and the backs at the ground and the fronts up in the sky, I've got 68% downforce. If it's an absolute number, it's a little more confusing because, well, all right, that now it's fairly close to, to 1, but let's, I don't know, go back to that high velocity. So now I've got 18, 1800 here and 2600 there. What's that ratio? What's that percentage? Yeah, just click back to the relative values and I know 68%. So that's easier to interpret, decide what I want to plot and if I want like, uh, if I like the absolute or the relative uh, value. So this is uh, quite very nice much more flexibility and giving me more insight and the code behind it is also more complicated than it was. So what's fixed? Um, a few things. Um, when previously uh, I assumed that the little bit of angle the car might have, you see it in F1, the rake angle, it can be quite severe, uh, although it's still only a few degrees and I disregarded that. But uh, the physics system the car is moving in a certain direction, it might have a certain rake, but then if you look at the car coordinates, there is also a slight 
up velocity in that. Now this is getting confusing I, I bet, but let's imagine you have a super super rake and basically the car is standing on its on its almost on its front wheels. Then you start to drive forward. Then it's almost as if that car is sort of flying upwards relatively to where it is moving. Still confusing, sorry, I bet. Um, anyway, the axis system and all the, the parts of the velocity that the car sees, so how it's moving through the air, all have a portion now. So wi with rake, there is a little bit of up velocity and that actually affects the downforce and the drag a little bit. Now this is all super minor, but it's complete now and I can do uh, all sorts of strange rakes or yaw angles and it will calculate all the velocities that the car sees. So with yaw, it sees a bit of sideways velocity and a bit of forward velocity. And if you add rake, it also sees a little bit of upward velocity. So all the axis stuff is, is done properly in VBA code and all the coefficients are, uh, are correct now. So that's one uh, big improvement. And that little uh, arrow balance issue that I had, giving us a few percent uh, incorrect balance, or at least the spreadsheet told me a certain balance, and then in real life it wouldn't, in, well, real life, sim life, let's not get ahead of ourselves. In, in sim life it would be a little uh, more to the front with the arrow balance than I would see in my spreadsheet. That's also fixed, and here we have the longitudinal ground restraint. That's an important one. So. Previously, this is kind of how I did it, with the car sitting in a wind tunnel and you blow wind over it super hard, super fast. You have to restrain the car somehow in the wind tunnel, otherwise it ro would roll backwards. Now typically, a lot of the time, it turns out, uh, which is in a way, well, it's not incorrect, but it's kind of confusing. They actually just like pull the handbrake uh, on the car or put it in gear or something to stop it from moving, which means that the rear tires or the front tires, whichever or restraint, that doesn't matter, it's on the ground plane, they are resisting the drag force. And that's what, I've, what I have here. Thing is though, that's not really a pure aero force, because if you imagine what that is, translated to a car going down a runway to do some aero tests, if it does a constant speed, like a really high speed, uh, it sees a lot of drag, which it has to push against, using throttle uh, power, more power typically. So that force goes to the driven wheels to, to push the car through the air. Al although the thing is there, it messes with the, the, the tire loads, the balance, because there is this driving force required to push against the air. Pure aero, in my opinion, would be removing all the tire forces and just do a, a coast down test. Right? So if you do a coast down test, of course the car will slow down because of the aero drag, then you remove that driven wheel force which messes with the tire loads. I can do that now. So let's look at the balance here. Uh, this is a Formula 3 car, uh, the, the, the year 2000 model. So now the balance is 38% here. At the right height rear 20 millimeters, front 10 millimeters. With using, say, using the rear tires, driving the rear tires with engine power to overcome the drag that it has, the aero drag. What if I do a coast down test, then I suddenly take, a, take this away and I ignore small effects like the rolling resistance. Look at the balance from 38%, it goes to 42.5%. That's because the driving force on the, on the rear tires to overcome the aero drag creates a back pitching torque. It's also it like it wants to do a wheelie basically, although very, very uh, little of it. it just removes a little bit of load from the front tires. So this is a new nice feature in my spreadsheet. I can decide if I want to do a straight line test with the driven wheels providing power, uh, like on a runway test at a static speed. Or I can tell the system to make the calculation as if it's doing a coast test with no rolling resistance and ideal situations. And the thing I've learned is that it depends really. Uh, a lot of the time wind tunnels uh, are done like this, but some of the time, and I haven't yet managed to get hold of Adrian Newey, uh, so uh, th that proper inside information isn't available to me, but wind tunnels they can do all sorts of compensation and calculation, but it's very good to know that the way they measure it is kind of important. And we'll see later with a GT car how important this really is. 
because here it's only a few percent, which is sort of, well, it's a bit more than margin of error, but it's, you know, a little bit of a change. It's nothing super, super dramatic, but we'll look at a GT car later and get properly uh, confused. So pure arrow, which is in my opinion how you would like to measure it. You don't want the effect of driving wheel force uh, messing up the arrow uh, is is done like this. So anyway, more power to me. So this is really good. I can choose whatever I want to plot and scale it properly, and that's all very nice. Another new thing is my real reality comparator. Now I had this one here, which I won't explain because that's lots of dots. Nice, I like dots. Here uh, I've chosen a car that isn't uh, sensitive information. You can find this data on the internet. So the Formula 3 car, year 2000 model, I can compare the sim to data. Now I've got lots of data that I cannot show you. So I can compare the aerodynamics of the simulator directly to a real data set, in this case a Formula 3 car from the year 2000. Um, why is that handy? Well, what are we looking at here? We're looking at XY and efficiency. XY means drag here from 0.35 to 0.47 and downforce and this is basically the range of available low to high downforce settings so here on the bottom left we'd have like the lowest wing setting and the little crosses are real data and the line is my uh, my simulator uh, output so at the lowest downforce say Monza we have 0.8 downforce with 0.37 drag and then you keep adding wing adding wing adding wing and then at maximum downforce, you're somewhere here, at 0.47 drag and 1.2-ish uh, downforce coefficient. And you see it's not a straight line, it's a curve. That's because adding wing, uh, like adding a click of wing, doesn't necessarily give a linear increase in, in downforce or, or drag. And that's where, where this comes in. You want this profile to be correct. So in the sim, if you go with super high downforce, at some point uh, the, the extra downforce you get from extra wing clicks isn't as much as you'd like and it sort of the effect can be reduced. Some of these data sets show actually that if you go super high on the rear wing for example you actually lose a bit of downforce because it starts to stall and it doesn't work anymore and only produces a lot of drag and you're being slower basically. So this shape, the curve, is important. On the red side here is efficiency. Efficiency is the downforce divided by the drag, so I call it how good the car is at turning drag into downforce. Um, and this depends really on the regulations and on the car, in this case it's about 2.7. So it's quite efficient here, from, from medium to high downforce, but at the Monza setting the efficiency is quite low. So at really low wing angles it doesn't generate a lot of downforce, but still generates quite a bit of drag, and that means the efficiency is quite low. These profiles are quite important to get the aerodynamic characteristics of the car correct. And now that I can compare this, let's mess with the numbers, which is always fun. So this is the front wing, where, what I'm highlighting here. So this is the minimum lift it has, downforce, negative is downforce, and how much it adds, and a curvature. There are a couple of curvature factors here. This is what we had before already, by the way. It's not new, but the comparison is new and quite nice, which is why I'm going on for it uh, about it for so long now. Uh, curvature says something about how these things look. So the curvature says if you add wing clicks, um, how efficient does the front wing add downforce as you Im go further and further on the downforce. Same on the rear wing. And these here, this, this red one and this uh, blue one, yes, I still am not colorblind, I think, are those profiles. So, well, let's look at the rear wing, because that's the, the biggest downforce contribution here. So it starts at minus 0 0.15, so that's downforce 0 0.15, and then we add 0 0.37, so that's 0 0.52, and we get this curve, right? So now let's disable the curves. I will have to remember what, the, what they were, so... 50 and minus 50 just for uh, for my memory disable the curves disable the curves see so now the rear wing just adds linear downforce and linear drag as I increase the, the settings of uh, the wing angle basically and look at my match with the real data it's all it's it's all wrong now all we, we've lost that curvature so we have to 
make the rear wing less efficient the more clicks we add and that's why uh, for the downforce it creates if we want that to be less efficient we've got a slight curvature now so as we increase the wing settings the gain in downforce is reduced we want to do the same with the drag for example we want to increase more drag as we go further into the wing settings higher in the wing angles See, so now we get a bit of that curve let's make it a bit more let's make it a lot more uh, so now we got a curve going which is kinda matching the real data quite well and the result is this curve for the real wing so once you start adding Mm, sorry, a uh, rear wing angle, you get a lot of extra downforce with almost no drag penalty, super cool, but then about halfway through adding extra wing mainly adds drag, you ver get very little downforce, you get a lot of extra drag and that's quite important for uh, the profile uh, of the car and typically these curves aren't always super smooth, you can see that it's a little it goes up and down a little, sometimes you go from uh, a low downforce package and then you add like, like another wing element on the real car and uh, that sort of detail isn't necessary really for, uh, for most uh, simulation but we can still approximate the real curves very well indeed so oh that's bad that's super wing super wing so this is a reasonable approximation then of of that curve and being able to compare the sim directly against real data now it's not true that we make this car specifically but perhaps we make uh, a car that's somewhat related to this it gives us an idea what the scope of the downforce might have to be and how it might look so that's pretty uh, pretty nice another small thing here is uh, this is kind of the same as here just on its own not compared to the real data so we can set a, a ride height one centimeter on the front two centimeters on the rear with a balanced target of 40% to the front and a tolerance of this no yaw and it plots all the wing combinations from low to high downforce that give us a balance of 40% give or take 1% so if we make that tolerance greater we, we should see more points a lot, oh that's yeah that's silly <laughs> all points basically so the, the greater window of arrow balance I get logically if you make this a huge window so point 0.5 so this means any balance between 35% and 45% will be plotted and there are a lot more wing combinations giving you that arrow balance than if you m have a really tight balance range that you would like to plot anyway what you see here is another interesting thing these green dots here are, is the ratio between the uh, front and the rear wing setting basically because in, in, in the sim we have like clicks of the wing 16 in this case for the front and 16 on the rear and I personally uh, personally like the uh, settings to match so if we have 16 settings on the front and 16 on the rear ideally with settings 8 and 8 we still get something of that 40% balance and this is the ratio and as you can see now the trend here is going a little upwards so my wing adding wing on the front and the back has slightly a, a non-linear effect although it's fairly close here if I screw this up uh, shall I? Mm, I will do... yeah why not? why not screw it up? it's never a problem so if the rear wing becomes super, ef super effective that means that each click of rear wing needs a lot more front wing and this, this line isn't straight so if I make it really ineffective it uh, goes wrong, it goes wrong ah, there we are it, goes, it doesn't go wrong but uh, X is my point isn't coming across ah, I should have prepared this anyway, another tool you don't have to understand I barely understand but actually secretly I do understand and <laughs> it's another thing that helps quite a lot with uh, getting the range of downforce working as I want <coughs> uh, forget about that right okay on to yaw 
Yaw is something uh, that's seen some improvements. Um, you can have each wing. Let's focus on just the front wing. So this is yaw on this scale from 0 to 45 degrees. And this is the relative downforce produced by the wing. So I can have a peak downforce. This time it's 2 degrees and a multiplier. Now let's do something silly. Now this, you wouldn't see this, but I can see the downforce increase 10%-ish at 2 degrees. Now let's say, no I don't want it, I want it at 5 degrees, something like that. If you somehow have your sensitive arrow, uh, you can do something like that. So the drop off in downforce, first the downforce increases if you go to 5 degrees and then it drops off. That's something we uh, never really used and there isn't a lot of data for yaw. However, the rear wing has the same option. Let's bring that into play. And here it looks quite different. And you can imagine that if you add yaw, so you go a bit sideways, and in this case the front wing gets more downforce and the rear wing is already losing downforce, then it changes the balance of the aerodynamics quite a bit. We can plot the balance. Ta-da! So here's the balance on the primary axis. So in this case, the higher it is, the more forward the balance is, right? So the balance is about 40-ish, 44%. And then we have we go sideways, a bit more sideways, the balance goes forward. And then it goes back a little, and then it goes forward again. And this behavior of aerodynamics, especially on like super downforce cars, is quite important because you will be at a few degrees yaw angle but just going through the corners. And if the yaw uh, arrow moves forward a lot, which let's let's uh, simulate. So now I've got the rear wing dropping off right away. And now I've got the front wing being magic and almost not losing any downforce, right? So the rear wing drops off as soon as we get yaw. The front wing actually gets a little bit more efficient all the way up to 7, 8, 9 degrees and then starts to drop off. That means that our arrow balance, see we got a rear wing dropping, front wing gaining, more downforce on the front, our balance moves fro forward. And this curve is quite important in how the car handles, especially once you get a bit of a slide going. If the balance goes too far forward, you get a lot more oversteer once you're already sliding, which is uh, typically uh, uh, possibly a thing, but not a lot of data available and it could vary quite a bit between uh, between different cars. But anyway, it's uh, interesting to plot this now properly. And there are a lot of things, uh, differ uh, differential, yeah, the differential. No, the diffuser is another part here which can uh, produce downforce that changes uh, at I don't know. Let's do something silly. So here, the the orange line is the diffuser, also a downforce producer. And now we've set that peak to 15 degrees ish. You notice it doesn't peak at 15. That's because we now have the source code, and I know how the math works. And this is all now verified and working correctly. So yaw behavior effect on downforce and stuff is uh, is all in there. Another new thing. Geez, more news. Yes, more. Um, can you tell I'm excited? I guess uh, you might. Is yaw rate. So going sideways is one thing. Uh, imagine sliding uh, the car on ice. Uh, you're doing 45 degrees sideways but you're still moving in one direction. A lot of the time you're taking corners on a, s on a circuit, you actually rotate because before the hairpin you go up and after the hairpin you go down. It's like you've, you've rotated uh, 180 degrees. You do that at a certain yaw rate and then the sideways aerodynamics play a role. So let's look at the yaw moment and let's ignore, oh this is the total downforce, interesting, don't need that, don't need that anymore, don't need that anymore, don't need the differential anymore. Yaw moment and balance, is, let's just look at the yaw moment. Right, yaw moment. What the hell is yaw moment? So that's how much torque moment is applied trying to turn or counter uh, the car turning. So if you imagine having 
a lot uh, of sort of well okay let's how to explain this a car basically going through the air doesn't want to go through the air it will have drag and it will stop if you don't apply power and it, any direction you try to move the car it will have aerodynamic drag but also when you rotate it it will also have aerodynamic drag so to speak and that's a moment resisting the rotation it comes from a few things just simply the sideways uh, when you imagine the car moving 90 degrees sideways it will have drag in that direction uh, a bit on the front and a bit on the rear of the car so the front sticks out the front and if you then start to rotate the vehicle the front wing will move left to right side to side basically and that creates a sideways velocity which creates forces and moments around the car center of gravity ah, it all gets complicated really soon but it's quite uh, quite a thing and it's a stabilizing effect so a few things are at play here lateral side force drag but then when going completely sideways and the torque the yaw moments here so currently I have a yaw rate of 50 degrees per second which is sort of uh, taking a hairpin and rotating uh, basically in about what's it three and a half seconds to do a hairpin uh, gives me a yaw rate of 50 and a moment of minus 7 now I change the yaw resistance torque to 20 and it's off the scale I have to enable it again minus 15 so we've doubled that torque by changing the yaw resistance the resistance to rotation aerodynamic moment that it gives another way to do it is change the side force produced by the front of the car and the rear of the car so let's give the front a lot of uh, resistance as if there's like a big vertical fin on the far uh, ahead of the car on the front wing like a, a side plate of the, of the front wing imagine it's huge uh, what that will do once you go sideways the front of the car will have more drag than the rear of the car so you get an oversteer moment basically so let's make that 0.5 and the number will probably get lower so this changes a little bit as we get more yaw we get a less negative value so this is quite let's go faster though uh, uh, ground speed 30 meters per second there we are whoopsie off the scale so at a reasonable speed 30 meters per second is what's 30 meters per second Niels 30 meters per second is 100 kilometers an hour so that's uh, not quite a hairpin and that's not super fast but still it's a speed and as we get more yaw so if we get more sideways then this moment becomes positive to quite a, a large number and a positive moment means you will get like an oversteer the, the moment will try to rotate the car in an oversteer way so let's switch these numbers then so now the front has 0.5 and the rear 0.3 let's switch them over see now the back resists the sideways drag a lot more and we get a lot less oversteer moment from being sideways at this speed than before so typically this is beyond uh, the area where you would like to be typically you don't want to want to be much more than five or ten degrees yaw but we can plot the effect of yaw and the, the moments and the forces and the balance much more in depth than uh, than we could so that's all quite neat and, and extra and nice um, is that all I think you uh, you're begging me to say it's all but no it's not all well it's kind of all of the major Im improvements here and that's pretty uh, pretty nice another thing I would like to load is a different spreadsheet because the problem gets amplified with the arrow uh, but I'm put them the problem first is finding enable yes yes I know that isn't a huge problem that it finds but it's just complaining a little bit so here we have a GT car kinda let's assume well actually we don't have a GT car we have like uh, the boxer cup car 
which is not a GT car, it's got a lot less downforce. Um, whereas GT3 cars, m you might see an efficiency of about 1.5-ish. So they turn the drag uh, becomes 1.5 times more downforce. But on the Boxer Cup, well, we don't know, but we assume it's a bit less. So we've got about 0.8 efficiency. Now, uh, this is not a lot of downforce. And the problem when you look at the balance, the arrow balance, is that if 100% of the downforce goes to the front, you would expect that to give you a lot of oversteer. But if the downforce is, I don't know, uh, one cup of tea, so, I don't know, a one kilo, almost nothing, then eh, that you'd, you won't notice that on a GT car that weighs 12 or 1300 kilos. So 100% balance on the front or the rear, it, it it's fairly useless uh, when their uh, aerodynamics are fairly inefficient and you don't get a lot of downforce. So the balance might look all wrong, but it's such a small number that it doesn't really matter. Um, the biggest thing though is since the arrow is small, that effect of having the car running against the wind or uh, doing sort of a, a coast test becomes huge. So now we're do doing a coast test with this car and then the balance here at this right height which isn't really a GT right height but that doesn't really matter so 36% of the downforce goes to the front right well the right and left but the front axle 36% and now we add the effect of doing a straight line constant speed test so the rear tires are driving the car and pushing it against the wind and causing a back pitching back flip moment look at what happens we go from 36% to 22%. And that's because there isn't a lot of aero and these balance numbers, they are just a bit skewed. And, and see, if you, if you have a cup of tea worth of downforce and suddenly the cup of tea moves to the front of the car or it moves to the back of the car, it won't change the handling all that much. So that's why it makes sense to look not just at the aero balance, but also at the percentage of static load on the front and on the rear. So Side by side here, on the right we have that sort of boxer cup-ish downforce level car with not a lot of downforce. And we look at what happens to the weight on the front axle, how much it differs from just the car sitting still without any aerodynamic forces. Through a huge range of ride heights here with 10, cent 10, 10, 10 centimeters on the rear to zero and also on the front. And we see that the difference in, in, in downforce versus the static load on, on the front axle is between 110% and 125%. With a huge spread in, 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 in uh, ride heights, that's a relatively little effect on the, the load on the front tires and the grip that they might have. And on the rear it's about the same, just a little different numbers. So we go with, it's actually much less. Uh, it doesn't really affect the tire load at the back too much. So we have a lot of aerodynamic moving around the balance, like like the balance moves around quite a lot. But if you look at the rear load on the tires, it doesn't change all that mu much. It's about 1.3 times the static load. So comparing that to the Formula 3 car, same speed, uh, look at how much that happens. So the front percentage static is a huge difference with only 40 uh, millimeters of ride height looking at here, so it's much, much less. We go between 37% more than static load to 84% more of static load. So the balance change here is actually less, but the effect it has, because we have a lot more downforce, it affects the load on the front axle a lot more. And that's that's an important thing to uh, to distinguish, and that's why these percentage of static load measurements help us uh, help me a lot with GT-ish cars or touring cars that don't have a lot of downforce yet. You still want to have a nice picture of what's happening uh, with uh, with the arrow. See, this is what put me off, and what's easy to get put off by: 22% front downforce. And then we do a coast test instead of a constant speed test, and we go to 36% front downforce. But that's an interesting thing, and in my opinion, uh, if you are looking for aero maps, you just want aero forces. You don't want the effect of 
the car tipping over backwards from having to push against uh, the drag. Because some of the time, yes, you are accelerating or doing a constant speed, but a lot of the time you're coasting or braking and you're not using that effect of, uh, of the tires causing a back pitching moment. So isolating purely the aero makes more sense, if you ask me. And that's something that we've, we've learned and we've also learned how real wind tunnels sometimes do that. And it gives us more options and flexibility uh, to uh, get proper aero, even though some of these spreadsheets things have to be fixed. No! So that's, uh, that's the new stuff. Um, back to something that looks like it worked. Uh, in summary then, lots of new arrow stuff in, in the spreadsheet, um, more, uh, better verified to work in reality, well, virtual reality, that is. Uh, ways to compare it to real data, uh, yaw stuff, which we ha didn't have before, and a lot of improvements in general, making this more accurate. So, previously then, let's uh, talk about that boxer, which uh, was one of those problem childs, because the downforce I was getting was actually a lot more to the front than I was thinking I was getting. And so I work on the car and then uh, the working uh, methods at Ryza are that since the beginning really, since 2010, that Renato and me sort of split the physics work between us. So some cars uh, Renato makes completely, uh, some cars I make mostly completely, but we always share uh, some of the data and numbers and I might provide some uh, stuff to him and he'll provide feedback to me. And Renato also does all the AI programming and, and that sort of stuff. You may also make some adjustments and tweaks to my uh, to my cars. And this is a, a good example why that can be a really good thing. Because with the Boxer Cup, I was sort of getting a lot more front arrow than I was thinking that I should be getting. Making the car a little, well, strange to drive because of the general car setup was a bit more uh, understeery to compensate for oversteery arrow. Luckily Renato then takes the car, drives it, thinks, well, it's pretty good, but let's adjust the arrow a bit, subjectively, by feel. Uh, I, I, I'm just sticking to the numbers, and uh, I'm too stubborn to deviate from the numbers, even though, as you saw then, the, the calculation could be wrong, and your results could be wrong. But I want to sort of stick to, uh, stick to the numbers and, and figure out what's going wrong then, which we have done now. But Renato is then stepping in and making adjustments uh, to make the car handle better than what I first delivered, so it's an uh, it's a two-way uh, uh, process that most of the time I've, I'm pretty confident and and, and genuinely feel that like it uh, makes the car uh, more better and more suitable uh, for release. So what does all this mean? Uh, well, from now on, hopefully my cars will uh, the, the my work that I do will be sort of better, quicker having a better view of what I want to compare it to and having a better overall view of, of the arrow and, and how it's measured. Uh, if you have data, if it's with uh, coast down test or constant speed test, I can plug all those things in, have a new knowledge about the yaw. So what I expect my work to become uh, a little easier because uh, good numbers should now result in slightly better handling cars. And the difference, as we saw with this uh, fair amount of downforce, car was only a few percent in the aero balance, so really that error is quite small, especially because the Formula 3 that year wasn't super high on downforce anyway, so the more advanced the cars become, the, le the less effect the error had, so let's not make too much of it. But anyway, uh, I'm now finally getting what I think I should be getting, because the calculations are now correct, so it should make my work uh, easier in that I plug in normal numbers and it should feel a little better than uh, than it did before. So uh, the work becomes more efficient and better and uh, we've learned in the process. So very long video, I guess, by now. Sorry about that. Um, with part failure, but also partly, uh, hopefully, a success trying to explain some of the things that we've improved. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if not, it could be a cure for insomnia. Uh, have, a nice, have a nice night in that case. Thank you for watching and uh, have a good whatever day or part of the day remains. Where is my streaming software? Here. Thanks guys. Bye bye.